Phil is a, a science writer for Kramer Fish Sciences in Gresham, Oregon, previously held engineering and management positions in the information technology industry. Began pursuing his interest in the history of science in college, has been a student of history, philosophy, and methodology of science for more than 26 years. So, Phil, come on up and enlighten us here on origin of species and natural selection. God bless. All right. You can hear me, I'm on. All right, great. So uh, just a fair warning, I want you to buckle your seat belts. We have a lot of ground to cover this morning. I'm going to try not to talk too fast, but we're going to go through a lot of information. So um, pay attention if you can. <laughs> so the, the title of my talk is, Does Natural Selection Drive the Origin of Species? And what I'm going to do is cr both critique natural selection and present a model which is an alternative to natural selection. So as I was getting ready for this talk, it was very interesting timing. A controversy erupted uh, recently. I don't know if any of you saw this or not, but let me just uh, read how this controversy started. So uh, Kenneth Keithley, who's an old earth creationist, publishes a blog uh, called Theology for the Church, and he had a real interesting blog uh, post back in March, and here's what he said. He said, Ken Ham is president of Answers in Genesis, which is by far the best known young earth apologetics ministry. The organization publishes Answers, a magazine targeted for a general audience. The latest issue, January or March 2016, has exotic ark animals and it's as its cover article. That's exactly what Steve was just talking about. The article is noteworthy because it argues for macroevolution, the theory that the species of today evolved from prior extinct species. Of course, his statement was very controversial. You don't usually put Answers in Genesis and Evolution together. And his blog erupted with a lot of comments, and he clarified his position a little further with a comment that he made in response. He says, remember the title to Darwin's book, Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Speciation is evolution. That's what it meant when Darwin used the term, and that's what biologists mean when they use the term. It's what it means when Ken Ham uses the term. And he further clarified that by saying AIG and Ken Ham claim that from 1,000 species in the ark, over 100,000 species of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians evolved. When one includes insects, the number goes into the millions. That's not microevolution. Biologists call that evolution, and so does the average person in the pew. The AIG model can avoid the label of evolution only by rewriting the dictionary. Now, it's an interesting claim because it's not the first time it's been made. I don't know if you're familiar with Hugh Ross, uh, who's an old earth creationist, or sorry, a progressive creationist. Here's what he said quite a while ago in his book, A Matter of Days. He says, perhaps the most stunning irony of the creation day controversy lies buried in young earth creationist literature. Those leaders who have leveled some of the most stinging criticisms at old earth creationists are actually forced by their own interpretation of scripture to be hyper evolutionists. Their confidence in the efficiency of natural process evolution exceeds even that of the most ardent non-theistic evolutionists. And he clarifies what he means by that a little bit because it's a big problem if, from his point of view. He says a young earth interpretation of the Genesis flood exacerbates the speculated speciation problem. According to this interpretation, a global deluge wiped out all land-dwelling, air-breathing life on earth except those pairs on board Noah's Ark. So the remaining few thousand species must have evolved by extremely rapid, hyper-efficient natural processes into millions of species. So he's saying, again, the same thing. Answer in Genesis, because it's saying that all these species came from just a few handful, they must be promoting evolution because that, according to, the, to Hugh Ross and Kenneth Keithley, is evolution. Now, of course, there was a response from the creationist community that. Um, this is one from Nick Sabato from... Creation Ministries International, and he says speciation has to do with variation within the biblical kind or barrenment and offers no support for microbe demand evolution. Speciation, therefore, is not ultra-efficient biological evolution at all, and modern examples of rapid speciation are acknowledged by both creationists and evolutionists. Informed creationists do not confuse or conflate uphill evolution with post-flood rapid speciation. So there's, two, there's strong arguments from both directions here about whether or not post-flood in particular speciation, all these species coming from a few, is evolution. So there's a lot of words being bandied about here, so it'd be helpful to uh, define some things. So first of all, what is a species? 
Well, species is part of a classification system originally derived by Linnaeus, and I'll just give you some definitions real quick. So species is de defined as a group of living organisms consisting of similar individuals capable of exchanging genes or interbreeding, so they can reproduce. They can crossbreed, reproduce, they're, they're um, part of the same species in that sense. Genus, which is a higher level up, is a group of living organisms sharing similar physical or genetic characteristics, typically consisting of multiple species. And these may or may not be able to interbreed. Species may be isolated from each other. And then, of course, you go up again to family, a group of living organisms sharing a common attribute or attributes, typically consisting of multiple genera. So family, genus, species. So what is a kind? Because kind was mentioned as well in those comments. Well, the term kind comes from Genesis 1, and here's an example from, taken from Genesis 1, 21 to 22, and then verse 24 as well. It says, God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. So that's a little bit more vague. So where do creationists generally place kinds in relationship to the classification system that we're all familiar with? So I figured a good way to do this would be to use a familiar example, cats. Okay. So the classification system is from the higher level down below. You've got kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So, for instance, cats are in, they're animals. They're Cordata, Mammalia, Carnivora, and Philidae. That's the family. And then within the genus, you have a bunch of different kinds of cats. So you've got Panthera, which is lions, tigers, jaguars, leopards, and snow leopards. You've got Asinonyx, which is cheetahs. Neophilus, which is clouded leopards. Puma, which is puma. <laughs> and lynx, which is both lynx and bobcats. And then you've got felis, which is more familiar. You've got domestic cats, uh, jungle cats, wild cats, black-footed cats, sand cats, and Chinese mountain cats. So what's a kind in this classification species? Well, most creationists would put a kind at the family level. So a kind would encompass a lot of different diversity. And still, be, so the, the idea is that all of that was created by God originally as a kind. So here's an example of the, the different, just to show you the different variety involved in a kind, the concept of a kind. You've probably got lions and tigers and, and cheetahs, and, or I'm sorry, lions and tigers and various leopards, including a snow leopard there. Um, in Asinonyx, you've got cheetahs, the clouded leopard, which frankly I think is about the most gorgeous cat out there. Just really pretty spots on it. Puma, lynx, and bobcat. And then, of course, you've got your domestic house cat, your wild cat, your jungle cat, black-footed cat, sand cat, and Chinese mountain cat. A lot of different variety there. Another example, if you're not tracking with that one, because I know not everyone's a cat person. How about dogs? So dogs, same thing. You've got, they're, all, they're in the same classification all the way down to here. So they're carnivores, et cetera. Canidae is here. Dogs have a lot more in the genus level, so you actually have 12 here. I'm not going to read through all of these, but there's a lot of them here. Um, they go range from African wild dogs and foxes of various types all the way into uh, uh, raccoon dogs and the wolves and coyotes and such that we're used to. So here's some examples of that uh, variety, of course, within the same kind. You've got various different kinds of, of dogs here involved and some real interesting variations. You've got different foxes involved, uh, bush dog. Those are some more, the more typical you'd think of as foxes. Here's a raccoon dog down here. Looks a little bit like a raccoon. Um, and of course, what you're familiar with, you've got on the left here, you've got wolves and coyotes and jackals. And on the right, you've got various breeds of domestic dogs. These are all within the same variety, the same kind. So the question is, where did all of these species within a kind come from? What's the origin of species? Well, when you ask that question, in, invariably, you always go to the concept of natural selection. So where did that concept come from? Well, Edward Blythe uh, published a, uh, in magazines in between 1835 and 1837, which is 22 years before 
the Origin of Species, he published the concept of natural selection. He was a creationist, and he believed that God created the original kinds, that all modern species descended from those kinds, and that natural selection is conservative, resulting in preservation of created variation. In other words, if uh, a variety or a variation happened that was not advantageous to preserving that kind of that species, it would be eliminated by natural selection. So the idea is that you've got random variation. So this, would, for instance, would be three different variants of the same creature. Two of them would be, say, A and C are um, you know, not advantageous to the species continuing. And then you've got a differential survival. They don't all survive, and that acts like a filter in the following manner. Two of them die off, one of them continues on, and the environment itself is actually the filter. The environment dispenses the death. So it's a natural process at, that selects some of the variations to continue and some not. So this is another way to diagram it out. You've got, you've got your created variation, but random variation impacts that. And some variations survive and some don't. Differential survival, and you end up with preservation over time. But that's not the concept of natural selection most of us are familiar with. We're familiar with the Darwinian one. So Darwin, actually, this is interesting, he had copies of those magazines. And a lot of text out of his Origin of Species book is taken directly from, almost verbatim, from Bly's articles, but he put a different twist on it, and that is, he argued that all modern species descended from one or a few original forms, not from different kinds. He also said that natural selection removes those injurious or harmful variations, preserving the favorable ones, and that results in the extinction of the harmful variations and the adaptation over time from the beneficial ones so the species got more and more fit or better and better adapted to their surroundings. And he argued that there was no limit to this kind of process. It could continue on forever. And of course, this is evolution. From Darwin's own words, chapter 4 of the Origin of Species, he says, if useful variations do occur, can we doubt that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others would have the best chance of surviving and procreating their kind? On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable individual differences and variations, and the destruction of those which are injurious, I have called natural selection or survival of the fittest. And then later on, in the same chapter, he says, I can see no limit to the amount of change to the beauty and complexity of the co-adaptations between all organic beings, one with another, and with their physical conditions of life, which may have been affected in the long course of time through nature's power of selection, that is, by the survival of the fittest. So he didn't see any limit to this process of adaptation. So let's compare the two ideas in natural selection. You've got Blythe on the left, Darwin on the right. How do they view variation? Well, both of them viewed variation as random. It occurred randomly in nature. And the environment was a filter that acted on that variation. In the case of Blythe, it essentially removed the harmful traits. In the case of Darwin, it removed the harmful traits, but really to the point is that it preserves the beneficial ones over time. The result then, in Bly's, in Bly's point of view, is preservation of the kind, or the species. And in Darwin's, it's adaptation. And Blythe, of course, would argue that magnitude of change is limited by the kinds God created, whereas Darwin says it's unlimited. So comparing those sort of on the same diagram level, um, really we have a conservative natural selection idea and a creative natural selection idea. This one's limited, that's unlimited. In, in Darwin's idea, you've got random variation is what you start with. You've got differential survival, which sometimes lead to extinction, the injurious ones get removed, sometimes, but most often leads to adaptation of a species, which can sometimes lead to extinction depending on the environment around it, but oftentimes adaptation then random variation occurs again and it goes through the cycle and there's no limit to the cycle. Another way to look at the differences is to compare what you've probably heard of as the creationist orchard versus the tree, the evolutionary tree. And the idea is that in the creation one you've got kinds that were created separately that have actually no connection to each other and over time some of them survive, some of them go extinct, etc. and you've got the different species at the end, whereas in evolution it all started with one or a few and everything branched off of that over time. So there's a very big unknown, however, um, that Darwin admitted to in this whole idea of natural selection, and that is how do traits get passed on? What are the laws of inheritance? Here's in Darwin's own, own words from chapter one of The Origin of Species. He says, the laws governing inheritance are for the most part unknown. 
No one can say why the same peculiarity in different individuals of the same species or in different species is sometimes inherited and sometimes not so. Why the child often reverts in certain characters to its grandfather or grandmother or a more remote ancestor. Why a peculiarity is often transmitted from one sex to both sexes or to one sex alone. More commonly but not exclusively to the like sex. In other words, no one knows. <laughs> he had his ideas about it, but no one really knew what was going on with inheritance. Well, it's interesting that right about the same time, some very interesting work was occurring on inheritance. And that was by Mendel. You've all heard of Mendel's laws of inheritance, probably. Well, uh, remember, well, Mendel started experimenting in 1856. Between 1856 and 1863, he did a lot of experiments on pea plants. 10,000 pea plants. And right in the middle of this, Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859. Well, by 1965, Mandela had concluded his experiments and published his results, including his laws of inheritance. And after that, the last, the sixth and last edition of The Origin of Species was published. Why didn't Darwin incorporate that in it? Well, because Mendel's laws really weren't paid attention to. They, were, they weren't really even really discovered and the impact understood until 1900. Also during this time, another interesting thing was happening, and that is DNA was in the process of being discovered. So this happened 10 years after Darwin, and it was first identified by Friedrich Miescher, but no one understood exactly what it did. Well, in 1927, quite a bit later, um, after the laws of heredity were understood again, uh, Nikolai Kolstov proposed that heredity was passed on by a large molecule that had sort of a mirror image, two, two mirror strands. By and the year later, uh, Frederick Guthrie performed an experiment that suggested that DNA carried genetic inf information. In 1943, there was an experiment by Avery, McLeod, and McCarty, which identified DNA as, in fact, being involved with transferring inheritance. In 1952, the Hershey Chase experiment confirmed it. And in 1953, of course, famously, Watson and Crick confirmed that there was a double helix, a molecule just like Nicole. Nikolai Kolstov predicted with tumor strands. So this confirmed that DNA is in fact the mechanism of adherence and really the instruction code for life. Now that was interesting because also around the same time um, another process was occurring and most people don't realize this had happened but right away after Darwin published his book evolution was accepted pretty quickly. However, very few people actually accepted natural selection as its driving mechanism. Between the 1880s and 1930s, a period which is known as the Eclipse of Darwinism, or the Eclipse of Darwin, everyone was looking around for different mechanisms for evolution that had nothing to do with natural selection, even though it accepted evolution as a, as a mechanism. Um, in fact, in 1903, Eberhard Dennert, a German botanist, kind of summed it up by saying, we are now standing at the deathbed of Darwinism. So, not too long afterwards, everyone was dismissing Darwin's natural selection. And to put it more to the point, um, Kellogg from Stanford in 1907 said, the fair truth is that the Darwinian selection theory considered with regard to its claimed capacity to be an independently sufficient mechanical explanation of descent stands today seriously discredited in the biological world. So obviously that's not the case anymore. <laughs> what happened? Well. Right about that same time, between 1916 and 1932, the discipline of population genetics was developed by Fisher, Haldane, and Wright. And they argued that the vast majority of variations, random change they called mutations, produced small effects which increased the variability of a population. And they statistically modeled how that could happen, including Darwin's natural selection as the driving force of evolution. And they convinced pretty much everyone, and this became known as neo-Darwinism. So this is essentially, this is uh, what Fisher was saying from a statistical point of view. Um, this is what he expected, the fitness effects of, of mutations and their distribution. He expected that you've got essentially evenly distributed deleterious or harmful and beneficial or helpful mutations, um, but that the vast majority of them were very small effects and some of them were bigger, but the, the, uh, the probability of improving a species happened here in the middle with all these small variations. Because a lot of variations over time, natural selection would kind of grab the ones that were important. There was much less chance of it being adaptable if it was a big variation one side or the other. So that's kind of the, the argument that convinced everyone. So going back to the diagrams here, essentially how that was modified is mutation is now seen as the, as the mechanism which either provides the variation for evolution or impacts the created variation um, of kinds. And of course with that also creationists begin to recognize that 
um, some mutations being harmful can in fact lead to extinction and even from adaptation that can happen as well. So real similar models now, but a different starting point. However, there are some issues with natural selection. First is that variation is limited. And of course, that is fairly obvious from DNA, from the discovery of DNA right away. Traits only exist because of the instructions in DNA that control how those traits are, are developed and then expressed. And, but that's okay. Neo-Darwinism said that's fine. Not a problem with that. Instead of saying beneficial traits, we'll say new information. So mutations can produce new information, and some of those are benefit, beneficial, and some is not. And so that was incorporated right into the Neo-Darwinian model. But there's more about variation being limited, and that is that they're not evenly distributed, the harmful and beneficial mutations. So, and that's an interesting point, because you remember this diagram from Fisher, shows even he assumed even distribution for the models of neo-Darwinian change in natural selection. But is that what Fisher actually obser observed? No, it's not. Here's what Fisher actually observed. He couldn't find any beneficial mutations at all. He assumed that they would be found. Um, however, we're a hundred you know, years approximately later. The question is, I mean, 1916, 2016, have any beneficial mutations been found? Well, the next chart shows you the correct distribution of beneficial mutations versus deleterious from observation and science. There you go. Now, I don't know if you see this or not, but down here, there's a little tiny tail. And actually, that it's really much smaller than that. For the scale, actually, to scale, it would be so small you wouldn't be able to see it. But so basically, you just kind of put a little triangle down there to explain that, hey, there's, they're almost all, there are very, very few that would even be considered beneficial. That's what it looks like. Now, this is a problem for Fisher's model, obviously. Uh, in addition to that, a large number of mutations that do occur appear to be non-random. Now, I'm not going to belabor this point a lot simply because there's a lot we could talk about right here, but let's just, I, I'm just going to sum it up by saying what scientists have observed is that a lot of mutations occur in the same exact spot repeatedly, in hot spots, and, the, and that they're limited in how much change they can, that, that occurs as well. Um, so they don't appear to just randomly occur throughout the genome or DNA. They occur at hot spots repeatedly. It doesn't sound very random. But the point there really is that whether we consider deleterious or beneficial mutations, um, whether they're random or non-random, they can only duplicate or destroy information contained in DNA that have never been observed to increase information. So in other words, most uh, mutations can only duplicate or destroy, and most mutations result in loss of information. And again, there's a lot that's been written on this. I'm not going to belabor the point. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, you, can, you can research it yourself if you want to look into it. And this has been recognized, of course, in the creationist community. This is Don Batten from the book Evolutionist Achilles Heels, and he says, speciation entails a rearrangement and or loss of existing genetic information from populations. Speciation gives no support to the general theory of evolution. So, in fact, creationists have seized on this in the model of adaptation. Um, and there's two different examples here. Um, you've probably seen these before. You've got dogs that have medium fur, and there's information for long and short fur in those dogs. And over time, that information gets split up such that by the time you get down here, the information for short has been lost, and all these dogs only have long fur. And the way that's seen is that adaptation, in this case, would be thin fur instead of long or short, but you've got original two dogs that have all the information for thin and thick hair and then um, that differentiates over time to the hotter climates, more like African wild dogs have thin fur genes and the Arctic wolf has thick fur genes, but the information has been split up over time. It hasn't been created, it's simply been lost and the natural selection has sorted it. So the current creation model then recognizes that new information is not created and that there are limits and says basically environmental fitter acts on existing information random change adaptation that's limited. But that's not the only issue with natural selection. Uh, first of all, the variation being limited raises the question, does that mean that there can be no large scale or long term changes? Because it's limited, so we can't make a lot of changes on a large scale or long term. Think, keep that question in the back of your mind and come back to it in a minute. 
But before we do that, we're going to talk about differential survival, which is the other portion of natural selection concept. And I'm going to submit that differential survival is not efficient or effective as a filter. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, it's too slow. And this is a problem that's known as Haldane's dilemma. What is that? Well, let's start with Charles Darwin himself in chapter 15 of his book. He says, as natural selection acts solely by accumulating slight, successive, favorable variations, it can produce no great or sudden modifications. It can act only by short and slow steps. And again, remember the neo-Darwinist Fisher um, in particular recognized this. And Haldane was also one of them. So he was one of the founders of population genetics and neo-Darwinism. So what's Haldane's dilemma? Well, in 1957, Haldane published a paper in which he described what he called the cost of substitution um, for a beneficial mutation to become fixed in a population. And what is that? Well, a beneficial mutation must substitute for the non-mutated genes. So all the, the variations are out there, and you get one that's beneficial, but it's new. Now it's got to replace all of the mutations that are different, the older ones, in order to become fixed under the whole population to take that characteristic. But that's limited by the reproductive rate of the population. Because remember, natural selection operates by killing off the ones that don't have the mutation. So it takes time. What he discovered, what Haldane's dilemma was, is that there's not enough time to generate all the diversity we see around us. In fact, as an example, um, in about 10 million years, only 0.02% of the difference between the human and the ape genome could be generated. Um, now, uh, supposedly, humans and apes branched off from a common ancestor about 10 million years ago. So there's 98% of the difference can't be explained in that time period. That's a problem. Now, this dilemma was debated in the 60s, but it wasn't resolved. And then it was brought up again in 71 and 1983 and validated, and then it was further clarified in 1993 and 2005, but it's still not resolved. In fact, uh, it's really not talked about much because there isn't much of a solution. It's sort of a skeleton in the closet. So in addition to differential survival being too slow, um, it's also the incorrect scale. And what I mean by that is the vast majority of mutations are too small to directly impact survival. And that leads to something called genetic loading, which you may have heard from, heard of. That term is coined by J.C. Sanford, who was a geneticist. He invented the gene gun process that's used in genetic engineering. And in 2005, he published a book uh, with genetic entropy in the title. Um, and then again in 2012, he published a study of H1N1, which is swine flu, that, uh, that demonstrated this effect he talked about in action, uh, in that the swine flu of several lineages accumulated mutations very rapidly and went extinct. So what did he do in his work? Well, he expanded on Chimera from 1997, and he showed that most mutations are nearly neutral. Remember that graph with all in the center? Um, but they're also too small to be selected against, so they accumulate over time. And not only that, but almost all, or essentially all, the beneficial mutations aren't selected at all, so they don't accumulate. Because they aren't even there to select or not select. They simply don't accumulate. They're too small. Um, he also showed that Chimera didn't account for noise, which, decre uh, which increases what Chimera called his no-selection zone. So it encompasses more mutations than he originally thought. And this has two important implications. The first is that these mutations rapidly accumulate. And the second is that the genome, as a result, rapidly breaks down and leading straight to extinction, which is not a, not a very exciting result. Um, so let me show you what that looks like graphically. So you remember that the... the uh, graph from Fisher I showed you that had the, you know, the uh, center here going up with the more mutation, et cetera. Remember the little triangle down the bottom, the beneficial. So you'll notice this is the no selection zone. Mutations that occur here are not selected by natural selection in Camaro's model or, or in Sanford's, and so they simply accumulate. You notice that there's a lot more deleterious ones that communicate or that accumulate than beneficial. So over time, a lot of harmful mutations build up in the genome. And then, of course, Sanford showed that this is overly optimistic. <laughs> there isn't this tail out here. In fact, almost every single mutation you can think of accumulates, and it's harmful. In addition to that, differential survival is also unpredictable. So you've got opportunistic predation. You've got accidents. You've got isolation. You've got catastrophes. This is, results in removal of information from the gene pool, and it's called genetic drift. So Wikipedia, of course, defines genetic drift as 
change in the frequency of a gene variance or allele in a population due to random sampling of organisms, chance has a role in determining whether a given individual survives and reproduces. Chance is not a very good filter because you can't predict what it's going to do. So essentially what, what this does is it randomizes differential survival and removes information. So most organisms don't survive because they're better adapted or more fit, but simply they're lucky, is what it boils down to. So the question is, how much does that really impact natural selection or, or the idea of natural selection, dif differential survival as a filter? Well, Fisher, of course, uh, back in the 1930s, says there's a minor role at most. He came up with the with the statistical underpinning for the Neo-Darwinian synthesis, synthesis. And Kimura, who we just talked about, uh, he recognized that these beneficial mutations couldn't accumulate, and in fact, most of the, the neutral ones did. So he said, okay, well, genetic drift must have a role in evolution. It's a primary role, because it, it's what breaks up the gene pool. Now, there's growing evidence that, in fact, genetic drift does play a significant role in the genetics of populations. So, Kimura was more right than Fisher, apparently. So, not only ha because of limited variation does the question arise, are there really, is it really possible to have any large-scale or long-term changes, but also the question now becomes, do sorted mutations accumulate over time? Can they even be sorted to begin with? So, if we're looking at comparing natural selection, the creation and neo-Darwinism point of view, we've already seen that new information doesn't appear to arise and it's limited. Now, it appears that maybe even the environmental filter concept is not very accurate. So here's how that would look, of course, in the diagram that I've shown earlier, um, is that genetic loading corrupts information at this level, at the variation level, and genetic drift removes information at the survival level. So both are impacted by this, making evolutionary natural selection really unworkable. Now this has been recognized by the secular scientific community. There's been a lot of papers and books published recently along this theme. So here are some examples. Darwin retried an appeal to reason. What Darwin got wrong? Does evolutionary theory need to rethink? Darwin's theory of gradual evolution not supported by geological history, NYU scientist concludes. Dogma and doubt reply to the comments on natural selection and self-organization, a deep dichotomy in the study of organic form. Darwinian evolution in the light of genomics and the types are persistent structuralist challenge to Darwinian pan-selectionism. And this one, an expose of the evolutionary industry from the Altenberg 16. The 16 evolutionists met together to discuss this problem. Some interesting quotes came out of that. Here's one of them from Susan Missouri. She says, scientists agree that natural selection can occur, but the scientific community also knows that natural selection has little to do with long-term changes in populations. That was the first thing I was talking about there. The question is, can you even get long scale, large scale, long-term changes? Here's another one from Stanley Salthey. He says, oh sure, natural selection has been demonstrated. The interesting point, however, is that it has rarely, if ever, been demonstrated to have anything to do with evolution in the sense of long-term changes in populations. Here's another one. Massimo P Piatelli Palomarini, I think he might be Italian. It says, the point is, however, that an organism can be modified and refined by natural selection, but that is not the way new species and new classes and new phyla originated. Remember the classification diagram? He's saying, hey, it might change things at the species level within a species, but it's not how we got species. And here's another one. It says, Darwinism and the Neo-Darwinian synthesis last dusted off 70 years ago actually hinder discovery of the mechanism of evolution. He's ready to throw it out. And this is even more to the point. Jerry Fodor said, basically, I don't think anyone knows how evolution works. <laughs> now, Michael Denton <laughs> nicely summarizes the result of these admissions. There's a debate occurring between what you call the structural view and the functional view. Here's what he says about it. He says, for two centuries, biologists have been divided into two opposing camps, the so-called structuralist or formalist and functionalist schools of thought regarding the fundamental nature of organic form. So the structural view is as follows. The idea that life on Earth is the result of a lawful natural process was explicitly affirmed by Richard Owen, William Carpenter, one of Owen's contemporaries, believed that the laws that define the plan of creation were impressed on matter in the beginning to bring about the creation and succession of life. 
Russell shows in his classic form and function that nearly every pre-Darwinian biologist believed life's overall order to be the result of lawful, if unidentified, processes. And the function of UE summarizes as follows. According to the opposing paradigm, often referred to as functionalism, the main designs of life are not the result of physical law, that is not imminent in nature, in other words, not internal or innate, or arising from intrinsic physical constraints inherent in biological matter, but rather the result of specific adaptations built additively by selection during the course of evolution to serve particular functional ends, ends that are imposed by the environment and that are external to the organism itself. So another way to look at this is you've got structural internal versus functional external. So what are those two views? Well, the internal or structural view holds that biology is self-organizing. The external and functional view holds that biology develops organization. The internal structural view holds that form is a result of internal mechanisms conforming to natural law, whereas the external view says form is a result of external requirements imposed by the environment. The internal view would say design is the expression of structure, and the external view would say design is the artifact of adaptation. This is essentially what Richard Dawkins says in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, that it's the appearance of design, but that's really an artifact of adaptation, of the process of natural selection. There's no designer, it's not really design. And of course, pre-Darwin, the internal structural view was the dominant one, and now, post-Darwin, the external or functional view is the dominant one. Now what's interesting is that this debate coming back up, it's causing a crisis. And what is that crisis? Well, this is summed up by Stuart Newman pretty well. He says, I think there is a challenge that self-organization and plasticity in general presents to Darwinian theory. To my mind, self-organization does represent a challenge to the Darwinian, such as the modern th synthesis and the perceived understanding of evolutionary theory. That's neo-Darwinism. He says, people are concerned that if they open up the door to non-Darwinian mechanisms, then they're going to allow creationists to slip through the door as well. <laughs> now why would that be? Well, because if organisms are self-adapting, that speaks of design. Now, there's a disagreement, however, which I find very interesting, <laughs> in that many of these evolutionists that we just quoted, and others, are beginning to assert that natural selection can't explain long-term changes, origin of species, but they can explain variation within a species which I mentioned before. But what's interesting is, most creationists assert that natural selection can explain both. So there's a, a divide occurring here on the, on the concept of natural selection itself. So what does that look like? Well, essentially, the, creation, or the evolutionary natural selectionists are admitting that it doesn't explain long-term change. So really, if we want to talk about long-term change, there's really only one model that's viable and that's the creation, or potentially viable, I should say, and that's the creationary natural selection model. So the question is, how does natural uh, selection explain the origin of species in the majority creationist view? How do these long-term changes happen in the creation model using natural selection as the mechanism? It's something called heterozygous fractionation which is a very exciting and complex term to, to <laughs> explain a very simple concept, and that is that created variation is heterozygous. It's not all the same. There's a lot of diversity in there. You've probably heard something along these lines from AIG or maybe from CMI or, or even ICR. You know, all the diversity for all of the, the variety we see now was all packed into that original genome. That's heterozygous. And that fractionation means over time it got divided up, isolated, broken up into chunks, and that, that and then natural selection sort of fixed those or solidified them into species eventually, being the lowest level. So here's an, uh, a diagram of how that would happen. You've got all that, you've got original diversity and it breaks up, you know, so here these colors combine together to make white, you know, this, these combine together to make these other colors. And then natural selection, one of these is not well adapted, so natural selection eliminates one of them. And then from there you go to another level. And it breaks up even further, and again, natural selection eliminates some of them. And eventually you end up with one little chunk or piece left from the original um, heterozygous or very diverse genome. That's the idea of heterozygous fractionation, and it's a process which just continually occurs over time. And primarily because of genetic drift. There's some problems with that. First of all, 
the question is legitimate. Does that require an unusual, an unreasonably large genome? maybe even larger than the one we're observing. Why do I ask that question? Well, it's important to remember that there's post-flood variation that, or pre-flood variation that happens and then post-flood variation happens as well, but a lot of that variation was lost at the flood. So we're not dealing with all the variation to begin with at the end of the flood. We're dealing with a subset of the variation from creation. So what does that look like diagrammatically? Well, here you go. You've got the different kinds and they split out in variation and then the flood happens and only one of those variation survives, and that has to then give rise to all the others, and some will go extinct, of course. So the problem becomes worse than just the species we see around us, because there are a lot, and if you look at the fossil record, you see a lot of different um, creatures and species and, and variations that are, that are extinct that don't exist anymore. So it makes the problem even worse. Um, in addition to that, you've got another problem, and that is novel adaptations. Uh, for instance, some of you may have heard of the bacteria that's been discovered that actually lives on nylon. It digests nylon waste products. And nylon, of course, is not a naturally occurring substance. It's man-made. Um, and uh, the, so the question is, in that original genome, was it also packed in there? The ability that wasn't expressed for thousands and thousands of years and then suddenly was expressed to deal with something that was brand new? And will there be future occurrences of that? So now you've raised the level of information even more of what's required in that original genome. Also, you've got a, the same dilemma that, that evolutionists have with natural selection, and that is Haldane's dilemma. And this goes back to the, the quote from um, Kenneth Keithley and from Hugh Ross, is you've got a lot of variation after the flood over a short period of time. Is it possible for natural selection to actually produce that? And, and it is a real problem. So, of course, the creationist community hasn't sat still on this problem. And uh, just recently, an article uh, or a paper, a couple of papers, were published by uh, Jensen at, at ICR, in which he tried to address this problem. And the way he did it was he looked at something called mitochondrial clocks. And so, mitochondrial DNA in the cell. Um, you can look at the different variations between different species and individuals, et cetera, over time, and um, kind of make a. a, a uh, sort of information theory, kind of go backwards and see uh, how long those different variations would have taken to to uh, express themselves, how, how far they're separated from each other. And you can calibrate it. In this case, he calibrates it to a, a 6,000 year time frame for um, for non-ARC species and for, uh, for about a 4,500 one for ARC species. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the clock details and whether it's valid or not. It suffices to say there's some very good evidence that they can be explained over a short period of time. But in his paper, he comes up with this chart to explain, to sort of test the different ways speciation could happen using this mitochondrial clock. So here's how this works. So this you've got, uh, in this case, a post-flood uh, example. And each of these dots represents a speciation event or a divergence in information in mitochondrial DNA. And there's several different uh, possibilities or theories about how speciation happened after the flood. You've got the, the, the early episode one, that a lot of variation happened at once and then it leveled off and it's been pretty much the same since. Um, you've got the episodic one, that, that, and this one is an interesting one because what it says is that species responded to environmental change. So there's a lot of change all at once when environment changed and then nothing for a while and then again. So it, it, it's a responsive idea. Then there's this heterozygous fractionation idea that it's just a steady, constant process because it's, it's just a natural breakdown process that occurs inevitably. And then you've got the idea of a late speciation, that nothing happened for a long time and then suddenly it all happened just recently. So he used uh, data from various species and families uh, to test these different uh, ideas. So he right out of the box, he comes out and says he thinks it's the hydrozygous fractionation because uh, it appears to be linear. So uh, the R squared value shows you how close the, all the points fit to the curve, in this case a line, and one being they all fit perfectly on the curve. And 0.99 is a pretty good R squared value. Um, but something that's interesting to note about this. First of all, look at the scale. You've got 106 species involved here, so it's a big scale. And second of all, look at this. You've got an interesting pattern developing. It goes down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Interesting. I bet if you blew that scale up, it looked like a stair step. So how do you blow a scale up? Well, you deal with fewer species, right? Well, so he's got some other 
graphs in here. So here you've got one, you've got 49 species. Look, the stair step pattern is very clear there and very clear here with crocodiles, for instance. And you see it here as well. And here, it doesn't seem to matter what the scale is, there's a stair step pattern involved. Here's some more examples. And even this one that looks like it's sort of a later one, doesn't really fit linear at all, still has some stair stepping to it. Interesting. Here's some more examples. And there's even one where you came up with it looks like it fits the late hypothesis better. So what's going on here? Well, I just pulled out some examples in different scales. You've got 293 species here still, and it doesn't fit a line very well at a smaller scale. You can fit a line, you know, it's 0.96. That's a pretty good fit to the points, but it's clear that there's something else that's going on here as well. And you've got one here with 102 species, same thing, and then the crocodiles is a pretty awesome example, I think, 13. What does that look like? Right there. But what's interesting is, it doesn't level out at any point and stop. So there is a linear trend here, even though the rate is not linear. So we've really got two things going on, a rate and a trend. So the episodic model is a better fit to the data for the rate. But it's still linear. So that implies there's actually two processes going on in speciation after the flood. That's an interesting point. One of them is responsive or specific. So in other words, it appears speciation happens in response to environmental change, and the other one in general just keeps going regardless of what happens. So the question is, what are these two processes that are going on here? Well, let's look at organisms to see if we can get a clue. First of all, something we need to note is that organisms respond to their environment. They change in response to their environment. There's all kinds of examples of, of change that happens very rapidly in frequency and magnitude or the presence and absence of traits even. And observed changes are, in fact, rapid, repeatable, reversible, and precisely controlled. That's what we observe. There's lots of examples out there about this. I'm just gonna, I just went to the internet and picked some, uh, some examples that are being touted right now and just to show you some examples. This is a tawny owl. Now, tawny owls have come in two different colors, a brownish and a grayish. And, of course, the grayish is more common in colder areas because it's better camouflaged. But what's interesting is those colder areas are starting to warm up. And what's happening? Well, the brownish owls are becoming more common. The frequency of the trade in the population is changing, and that happened quickly in about 50 years. Here's another example. Pink salmon. For those of you that know salmon, uh, they migrate to the ocean. So they are born in fresh water, they migrate to the ocean, they mature, and they come back to spawn. And that, then different life histories, different species of salmon have different life histories, they're called, where they have different timing for migration. And that timing can be critical to their survival long term. They may come back at the wrong time or go out at the wrong time. It's critical. What's interesting to note is that there is now developing an earlier migration response as the climate changes. And it's not just behavioral, it's genetic. The actual gene genetic code is changing in response to changing environments. And this has happened in only 40 years. It's very rapid. Here's another example. This is the green and only lizard, which if you go down to Florida, you'll find quite a, bit, quite a few of these. And they tend to live in trees. What's interesting that's happened there is there have been some brown li lizards that have been introduced, and they've been encroaching on the habitat. So what have the green lizards done in response? Well, they've moved higher up in the trees. And how are they able to do that successfully? Well, what we found is they now have bigger pads on their toes and stickier scales. And that all happened in 20 years. What's that? Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, Geike, you're right. So yes, that's a big change. <clears throat> now we can talk as well. So anyway, uh, <laughs> And here's another an example of rapid change, an Italian wall lizard. Now, these are interesting. They were introduced in the 70s to the island of Pod Mercaru. And what happened there is the, their food source on that island was different. So they switched from an insectivorous diet to a plant diet. That's a pretty significant change. But that wasn't the only change. That accompanying that, they also developed larger hills, heads and sequel valves. So the, their digestive system changed and developed valves to adapt to this new diet. And that change happened in 40 years. That's a pretty significant change. But change isn't just rapid 
There's also a lot of examples of repeatable and reversible change. And of course, I don't have time to go through all of them, but there's literally thousands of them. So I'm just going to pick a few. Darwin's finches, Omicus, which we'll come back to what that is. It's a fish. Three-spined uh, three sickleback, fig nematode, and Nemoria arizonia moss. Now, of course, I'm picking at least two fish because I do, after all, work for Kramer Fish Sciences. So I have to do that. Darwin's finches. You're probably all familiar with this drawing. Um, this, is, this is actually a, a drawing by, I believe, Stephen Jay Gould um, after Darwin's drawings from his journal. And Darwin, of course, went to the Galapagos Islands, saw these different fishes, or finches with all of these different um, beaks. And that, you know, he tried to explain by natural selection. And so you'll notice, for instance, you've got quite a bit of variation in beak, both in width and depth, going on here in the different finches. What's interesting is Darwin tried to explain that by um, uh, changes in diet, so natural selection would favor certain beaks over others depending on diet changes and climate and things like that. And in fact, that's found out to be the, the case. That, that actually happens. So here's an example um, of a medium ground finch, a study that was done um, between the mid-70s and mid-80s, and um, this is beak depth measurement here. What they discovered is that beak depth changed depending on the kind of climate. So in a drier year, beak depth increased. And when it wasn't drier than normal, it kind of went back down a little bit, dry happen again, dry happen again. And then this one's a little hard to read, but this is a wet year. It went the exact opposite. So these changes seem to be tracking with the environment. And not only that, but they're repeatable and reversible. That's not the only kind of change that happens that's reversible in Darwin's finches. What's interesting is that on Floriana Island in the Galapagos, since about the 1850s, there have been small, medium, and large tree finches. And they're characterized in differences, you know, in beak shape, body size, and, and song, but they all look similar. They have the same plumage or feathers. But in recent years, the large fish, finch has disappeared. It's gone. It can't be found. It's not observed. So the question is, did they just go extinct without a trace? So some scientists went to study this problem, and what they discovered was really interesting. First of all, they discovered there's evidence that the small and medium finches, which are the two of the three that were originally there, are merging into a single species. Why do I say that? Well, because if they look at the beak morphology and the body size, they show that some birds are combine the features of both. Not only that, but <clears throat> these hybrids are becoming more common. And when they looked in 2005, there weren't any in the population. Now it's almost 15% of the population. So the, the speculation is that, or the hypothesis is, that the large fish, finch likely merged with a small and medium, and that those are merging as well. So really, what it looks like what's happening is that the whole speciation is reversing in less than 200 years, from three different species down to one. Rainbow trout and steelhead, another example. Rainbow trout migrate to the ocean, or I'm sorry, don't migrate to the ocean. They're called residents. They stay. They're residents in fresh water. Whereas steelhead are anadromous. What does that mean? Well, it means that they migrate to the ocean and then return to natal streams to spawn. And in order to allow them to do this, they go through a process called smultification before they migrate. What does that mean? Well, they gain the ability to survive in salt water, osmoregulation, and they change color, among other things. They also typically gain size and change shape slightly as well. And so here's an example of some juveniles. On the left, you've got resident rainbow trout. On the right, you have juvenile steelhead. You can see the most obvious difference is that they're different color, hence the name steelhead. They're shiny like steel. But those changes get greater as they get older. So this is an older juvenile steelhead. You can see the color is different. This is an adult resident rainbow trout. And this is an adult steelhead. Significantly different. What's interesting, though, is that for years, it's been suspected that these are the, the trout, resident rainbow trout and steelhead are actually two forms of the same species. However, until smultification occurs, they're virtually indistinguishable. And obviously, it's multiplication. When it happens, they change colors, so suddenly you can tell the difference, among other things. That's the most obvious sign right away. So recent studies have, in fact, confirmed this. And, I, and actually, the firm I work for has been, done a lot of research in this area. Um, an adamous offspring, so steelhead, can be produced by two resident parents, or one resident parent and one anatomous parent. So in fact, um, there's indication that uh, the reverse can happen as well.
And what's also been discovered is that environmental factors like temperature and flow and the distance to the ocean where these populations are at, so how long it takes to migrate and back, influence whether or not a juvenile Omicus becomes a resident trout or a steelhead. And the ability to switch from one form to the other appears to be innate, inherent, and not affected by what's called selection pressure. In other words, in conditions where you would think for natural selection it would be disadvantageous to be a steelhead, that eventually that trait would disappear from the population. Well, there's a study done uh, by Thrower and Joyce in 2004 that was really interesting. They took a population of steelhead that was stocked into a lake in 1926, so it was originally steelhead. They were in a lake in 1926, but what happened was the lake had a barrier of falls, and so fish that smolted, became steelhead, and left, couldn't come back. So they couldn't keep adding their genetics back to the population, so the entire population became resident. Now, the, now what was expected is that after 70 years, 20 generations, that the ability to become an anatomist would be eliminated from this population because it's heavily selected against. All the genes go away. They all leave when they smolt. They don't come back. But what was found is, instead, when they did experiments on these with offspring and allowed them to get to the ocean, that significant numbers of anatomist offspring were still produced. So that implies that the ability of, of Omicus to become either anatomist or resident is both repeatable and reversible. And Omicus is an example of a partially migratory species. There are lots of these out there, including fish. Other partially migratory fish include brook trout, cutthroat trout, sockeye salmon, arctic char, cod, brown trout, Atlantic salmon, dolly varden, IUN, and smelt. Um, and by partially migratory, some of them stay resident, some of them go to, go to the ocean and back. And this type of behavior is common among all the, well, not all, but many animal taxa all the way from insects to higher vertebrates, and usually the two different forms are characterized by behavior but also size and function. For instance, one example is insects that migrate are larger and have longer wings than those that stay. Um, and this is repeatable and reversible from generation to generation. Here's another example of two different forms in a species. Again, fish, because again, I have to put in some fish since I work for Creamy Fish Sciences. This is three-spined stickleback, a really colorful and very small fish. There are two life histories of this fish. One is a marine one that lives in the ocean and enters rivers to spawn. The other one is freshwater. And they live mostly in lakes, but also in rivers and streams. And it's thought that they, that just like that example where the resident population came from the steelhead, that the freshwater populations originally came from marine populations. They have two basic forms. The marine one is larger in size, has a darker color, and it's heavily armored with, with rows of armored plates, bony armor plates, as well as having a pelvis with two long spines in it. And the freshwater one is kind of the opposite. Smaller size, lighter color, few or no armor plates, and they have only a, what you call a remnant pelvis that, that doesn't have any spines. So here's an example of a couple of different armor. Uh, this one, of course, has armor plates all the way down its body, and this one has just a few. And you can see, of course, why they're called three-spine stickleback. So, of course, what's interesting is the armor is advantageous in the ocean keeps you from being eaten by large predators, but it's not in freshwater because armor's heavy and it's harder to move around, and when you get in a, a more enclosed, confined environment, it's a disadvantage. The opposite is true with the pelvis. Uh, you've got a spiky pelvis that protects you against fish in the ocean, but when you get in, into freshwater environments, especially lakes, it's a disadvantage against insect predators who latch on to the spines. Now what's been discovered is that there is a gene that controls our place called ectodiseplasin. And basically there's two different versions of this gene, um, and one that's considered regular and one rare, that's based on the frequency in the marine population. What's discovered is that if you have, a fish has two copies of the regular gene, they get all the armor plates. If they've got one copy or two copies of the rare, they don't get any armor plates. And if they have one of each, they get a varying number of plates. So marine sticklebacks, of course, have two copies. And freshwater stick sticklebacks mostly have two copies of the other one, so they don't have any armor. So the point is that the occurrence of the armor is controlled by the presence or absence of one version of a gene. So in other words, the presence or, or absence is determined by inheritance. Now, the pelvis is controlled by a gene as well, but that one controls gene or controls pelvis development. So 
in developing fish with a full pelvis, the genes turned on everywhere, including at the head, pituitary, and pelvic region. And in the fish that don't have a remnant pelvis, it's turned on everywhere except for the pelvic region. So what that means is, the presence or absence of a pelvis is determined by the expression of gene, not the version. There's only one gene. And that means that it's determined during development. They look exactly the same, but when they're developing embryonically, it's either turned on or off. So the, uh, the loss of armor and uh, the spike pelvis, uh, it also apparently has recurred repeatedly because a lot of different freshwater habitats have been colonized by these fish. It also is occurring right now because along coastal rivers, these two forms still breed and they still produce both marine and freshwater offspring. So this change, adaptive change, appears to be repeatable, reversible, and controlled by both inheritance and development. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, and furthermore, when the study looked into it further, it discovered that the control happens by multiple genes spread throughout the genome, not just in one's place. So there's a lot of different information in the genome involved. And that it happens by dynamical, dynamic reassembly of blocks of genetic code. So it's not just in, all pla in a lot of different places, but this code's moving around as well. In addition to that, there's both protein coding and a non-coding or regulatory DNA sequences involved. And in fact, the regulatory or non-protein coding sequences have the primer, primary role. This is actually a very important insight. And we're going to come back to this later, so hold that thought. Okay? One, another example, fig nematodes. Now, fig nematodes of, the genus, of this genus, Pristionchus, they colonize a fig after arriving on, on a wasp. Uh, pretty typical. Here's an example of, here's one of the wasps that pollinates the figs. Here's a fig that it pollinates in. And when they get there, typically they are small and have a simple tube-like mouth for feeding on micro microbes. But their offspring can develop into as many as five different forms. Now, two of those forms feed on microbes, and three larger forms feed on other species of nematodes. What does that look like? Well, here's an example from Reunion Island, Africa. And these are two of the five different types. So this one is a huge and different shaped mouth, feeds on nematodes. This one feeds on microbes. Here's some other examples from Australian, Australasian ones from Vietnam. These are the five different forms. You notice these are the same scale across all of them. That's at 20 micro, micrometers or microns bar. There's five different forms, smaller mouth ones and this gigantic version. And here's an example of two of the species side by side, the forms that are similar. They're different, but they're similar, kind of look like they're similar types of forms across two different species. So there's 10 forms there. Now what's interesting is, this is an example of a poly. <laughs> so genetic studies have determined that these all come from the same genetic code. So in other words, they're developmental. So here's the three different species that they were studied, lined up again with the forms that seem to be similar. So you've got 15 different forms, and all of these are coming from the same genetic form, or genetic code. Uh, you know, the genetic code for each species. So this is another or a different mechanism of variation than the ones we just talked about, but it's still repeatable and reversible. So just to recap, Omicus is what you would call polymorphic, and its variations come from genetics. Polymorphic means many form. Three-spined stickleback is both polymorphic and polyphenic, so it comes from genetics and development. And the fig nematode are polyphenic, so it comes from development. There are many other examples of this. Pretty common one you've probably seen is an Arctic hare. This is an Arctic hare in its winter coat. This is an Arctic hare in its summer coat. And this is a velveteen rabbit going between the two. It looks a lot like a velveteen rabbit in my opinion, but <laughs> it's losing its winter coat. So in other words, it changes its form, its expression from the same genetic code based on environmental input to match its surroundings. Here's another even more extreme example, the Neomoria arizonia moth. Here's the moth. Here are the caterpillars. Can you see that? There's two caterpillars in that picture. Okay? There are two forms. One of them resembles oak flowers. That's the caterpillar right there. There's the oak flowers. And one resembles oak twigs. There's a the caterpillar. There's the oak twig. They live in, live in trees. And here's interesting, is that the caterpillars that hatch in the spring, they look like oak flowers, because oak flowers are around in the spring, and the ones that hatch in the fall look like oak twigs because there aren't any flowers around. What's even more interesting is, the ones that hatch in the spring start feeding on flowers, and then they start looking like flowers. And they grow up, 
lay eggs, die, and then those hatchlings come out and they look exactly like the young spring ones, but they don't have any flowers to feed on, so they feed on leaves and they start looking like twigs. So this is an example of the input, in this case their diet, determines the development of the output. There are also some examples of precisely controlled change that I want to talk about. The first one is hammerhead shark cephalofoils. That's the, the hammerhead, the, the wing type thing, and pectoral fins, and the other is finch beaks. So here's some hammerhead shark variation. You've got your, giant, your great hammerhead, your wing head. Look at the size of that thing. And the scoop head and monohead, which are much smaller ones. What's been determined is that across eight different species, here that sort of a diagram of the different head shapes, wing down at the bottom, et cetera. Um, you've got a lot of variation there. And these numbers in the center are the percentage of body length uh, that the width is. So for instance, this one, 19.3%, that this width is 19.3% of the total body length. This one's almost half its body length. I mean, it's got a huge wing on its head. But what's interesting is, a study, you, when you, these are studies, you look across a bunch of different species within the hammerhead shark variation and a bunch of different populations, and here's what you find. The cephalofoil area, which again is that foil or, or hammerhead part, plus the pectoral fins area, if you measure both the area, both it, it equals a constant. And that's true across all these species. So in other words, if you have a species that has a large cephalofoil, it has small pectoral fins. If you have a species with a small cephalofoil, it has large pectoral fins. And it's a constant. Um, this is not random variation. It strongly suggests that this variation is controlled by a pre-programmed, I put in quotes, function or algorithm. Well, what's a function or algorithm? Well, a function would be defined as a relation between a set of inputs and a set of permissible outputs with the property that each input is related to exactly one output. In other words, a function takes something, gets an input, gives you an output based on that input. An algorithm is a procedure or formula for solving a problem. An algorithm, for instance, can use functions. So what I'm suggesting is this may be an example of an input from the environment being put into an algorithm and giving you an output because it's precisely controlled. So next we're going to talk about Darwin's finches, but first we're going to take a break. <laughs> so I think it's about 15 minutes. Thank you. All right, well, while, while uh, people are starting to filter back in, for the rest of the talk, I'll just uh, go through these slides of Darwin's finches because this is my next example. So we've been talking about uh, rapid change, repeatable and reversible change, and now we've been talking about precisely controlled change, specifically with the hammerhead shark and how the, the cephalofoil and pectoral fin area combined is a constant, which implies a function or algorithm. Um, but the, another excellent example of precisely controlled change, I'm going to argue, is in Darwin's finches. So you may have all seen different pictures of Darwin's finches. There's a lot of variety in the Galapagos Islands in, um, in the different kinds of finches in both color and size and beak shape, etc. So here's just some of the, the different finches. You've got your common cactus finch, your large cactus finch, your green warbler finch, a large, medium, and small ground finches. And you've got a woodpecker finch and large, medium, and small tree finches. These are just some examples. The woodpecker finch is a really interesting creature. It, it probes for insects. You can see it's got a stick right here. It's using a probe. It's really a rather fascinating creature. Now, what's interesting about the Darwin's finches is, if you take a look at the different beak sizes in particular, um, you can kind of arrange them and see that they correspond to things like diet. So, for instance, over here you've got your vegetarian uh, tree finch. If I can get my pointer, there it goes. Vegetarian tree finch and uh, insect forest tree finch, etc. going around. You see that uh, this is a fruit eater. These are insect eaters. That's a cactus eater. These are seed eaters. And this correspondingly, they have different kinds of bills. These are crushing bills, probing bills, grasping bills, and a parrot like bill. So, uh, it appears that the adaptations or the variation of these bills is related to diet and to function the bill that's, that ha allows them to eat what they do. So uh, it's, they've long been uh, 
put forth as a really great example of natural selection in action. And that's, there's a paper in 2014 that I'm going to talk about a little bit here that starts with that assumption and then they kind of explain right here. They say, in summary, the evolution of biological shapes in general and the adaptive significance of bird beak shapes in particular have been an area of much interest in the literature with many authors hypothesizing that bird beak shape is heavily optimized for feeding and foraging behaviors, vocal song structure, and other external conditions. That's the natural selection explanation for these varieties in, in the bird beaks, particularly with Darwin's finches. They, on, they go on to say, interestingly, an alternative point of view suggests that beak shape diversity mainly results from morphogenetic processes independent of adaptation with constraints being largely imposed by the beak developmental program within this hypothesis beak phenotypic variation and morphological adaptation would be limited or strongly biased by the structure and dynamics of its developmental program that's a big mouthful <laughs> okay so what's he saying here well what they're saying is that there's opposed to natural selection there's another point of view about how these variations arise and that is that it is imposed by what happens during the development, specifically embryonic development of the beaks, and that they follow a structure during that process. It sounds a little bit like structuralist versus functionalist debate to me. So it's interesting, they decided to go and test these two views, and they figured the way that they tested two views is to actually look at the variation in finch beaks to see if it seemed to be following a structure or was more or less random. Here's what they found. He says, to further quantify the diversity of shapes, we fit polynomial functions to the beak profiles and search for the beak shape with the simplest functional form. This turns out to be the geospeza in the Darwin's finches, which are fit well to within the error of our methods for recording shapes by a parabola, y equals ax squared plus bx, a mathematical formula. The shear collapse of all other songbird beaks, catch that, all other songbird beaks, not just the finches, onto this shape implies that all beak profiles are well fit by an equation of the form 0 equals ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey. In other words, they're saying all of these beak shapes fit to a precise mathematical equation. Here's a graphical example. And I'm gonna, it's kind of hard because it's real small, but I'm going to read what this caption says because it kind of explains a little bit. It says uh, the basic pattern of beak shape diversity. On small phylogenetic scales, that's the species genus, etc. Beak shapes collapse under scaling alone. For example, the two geospeza uh, species on the top left, creating groups of similar beak shapes represented by colors. These groups shapes in turn collapse onto each other under shear in their length direction. Specifically, all group shapes collapse onto the shape of the blue colored group. So, blue colored group, blue colored group, blue colored group. The blue colored group can be approximated to an extremely high precision as a section of a parabola, as shown on the right. There's a parabola. They all fit, so here's the dotted line, you see the parabola. They all fit as a section of a parabola. The combination of this hierarchical collapse under scaling and shear onto the blue colored group and the collapse of the blue colored group on a parabola lead to the conclusion that all beak shapes considered here are conic sections. They're a precisely defined geometric shape. I don't know if you remember your geom geometry, but if you take a cone, you can get all the different geometric shapes by, by basically taking cross sections of the cone. What they're saying is that all these big shapes they've looked at for the Darwin's finches and other species of birds collapse onto a precise geometric shape. Interesting. They conclude, the present study significantly limits the potential set of parameters that can be optimized since the intrinsic developmental pathways place strong constraints on the set of beak shapes that are actually produced. Any optimization can only occur within the subspace of shapes that is readily available to the existing beak developmental pathway. Again, another math mouthful, what does that mean? What that means is that optimization, natural selection, has very little, if anything, to do with it. It is controlled by the existing beak developmental pro pathway. It's controlled by the genetic processes internal to the organism during development. So this is a clear case of a function or algorithm controlling variation, controlling the outcome. It's mathematically precise and controlled by the organism itself. And you probably picked up on the fact that evidence suggests that it's not just the Darwin's finches, but most songbirds, beak shapes are similarly controlled. That's pretty interesting. <laughs>
is this natural selection. Some will say Darwin's finches are a good example of natural selection. Well, remember from the very beginning, natural selection assumes two things. Adaptation results from slow filtering of random variations. Observed adaptation, as we've just talked about, is, however, rapid, repeatable, reversible, and precisely controlled. It's not, ran or not slow, and it's not random. And we also talked about earlier how the dif differential survival is not a good filter because it's too slow, it's too broad scale, and it's too unpredictable to efficiently and effectively sort variations. It's actually a lot more random <laughs> than the variation. So that actually leads us to an interesting place because this is the creationary natural selection model we talked about earlier, where you've got created variation, heterozygous, differential divisor, fraction, you know, breaks it up, fractionation, leading to adaptation, and because of genetic loading we talked about earlier, eventually it leads to extinction, and genetic drift also leads toward extinction or movement information. So in this model, genetic loading influences created variation, and genetic drift influences differential survival, but the process is natural selection variation, and a filter leading to adaptation. What I'm saying is this may in fact be unworkable. In other words, natural selection in the creation model, even at the species level, not the long-term level, may be unworkable. Why do I say that? Well, because there is a competing model that we just talked about it. Variation being directed, not random, by the organism itself, and the organism then distributing itself in response to its environment, leading to adaptation. So it's involved with the genome itself, the instruction code, not random variation, and geography, meaning climate, topography, etc. So in other words, it appears we have a process going on where the organism directs its own variation and then distributes itself into the eco ecological niches that match that variation that it has just generated and that leads to adaptation and it can continue to go around. So there's two different processes we're looking at here. But you say, well, wait a second. Aren't there some very clear examples of natural selection actually filtering? Because I just said it's not a good filter. But aren't there some examples of natural selection filtering? I mean, we've all heard of the peppered moths, right? Classic example of natural selection. Appears to be a variation and then Predators, birds in this case, are selecting which moth they're going to eat, therefore affecting the frequency of that trait in the population. Isn't that natural selection? Random variation, selection by a predator, in, it, the, the, uh, the adaptation happens in the population. Well, that's interesting that you should bring that up because <laughs> I don't think that's what's going on at all. In fact, here you see some peppered moths. They've got two variations. They've got the black and the speckled. And the speckled moths were more common in the 1850s. And by the 1950s, the black moths were more common. And that change occurred over approximately 100 years, obviously. And it was made famous, documented and made famous, by photographs showing moths on trees and showing their camouflage. And before we look at those photographs, let me make one other point. Since 1964, the speckled moths are becoming more common again. So it's going reverse. Okay? So here's the, probably some of the famous photographs you've seen of the moths on tree trunks. Okay? And especially with the low light on the screens, it's really hard to see, but let's see if we can pick out the moths. Here's the speckled moths, it's obvious. The black moth is right here. Pretty well camouflaged uh, on that black tree trunk. And some of you may have picked that one out. I'm not sure anyone, any of you can see the second one. Here's the black moth. Where's the speckled one? It is right here. Very well camouflaged. Now, it seems obvious, looking at those pictures, that if I was a bird and I'd come along and try to eat these moths, it would be pretty obvious which one I would pick on the white trunk and which one I would pick on the black trunk, right? Natural selection action? Well, that's exactly what has happened over time, is that pollution has darkened the trees, and so the idea is that pollution is dark in the trees, so the white moths now stand out, and the birds have come along and 
selected in the population, natural selection. And then, of course, the reason why it's going back is that they've cleaned up a lot of the areas. There's no longer as much pollution, so the speckled moths are camouflaged better again, and so they're becoming more common again. What's interesting is a couple things. First of all, live moths actually don't behave this way. They recognize when they're camouflaged and when they're not, and they move. They get out of the way. Um, in addition to that, a lot of these photographs are actually staged. Uh, in that many of these famous photographs, they, they took li uh, dead moths or sedated moths and either glued or pinned them to the trees a as an example of what they thought happened. But that's not what was observed. Okay? But there's a bigger problem with this, and that is that the peppered moth caterpillars also have camouflage. So this is the dark colored one right here. It's the caterpillar on the twigs, and this is the, from the speckled one. And it's green. This one's black, that one's green. Interesting. Because different trees in different stages, in different seasons, are going to have both older, darker limbs and younger, green limbs. Which means that depending on where it is in the tree, the moth, or the caterpillar, this one is going to be better camouflaged in one section of the tree, and this one another, or in one area of the forest, or whatever. And so the question becomes, are these variations in the color frequency from habitat or predation? Because there's more than predation going on here. All the trees aren't black, or all the trees aren't white. The trees are varied in colors in various places and various seasons, and these Caterpillars and moths know how to find what the camouflage is, therefore hiding themselves from the bird and reducing the amount of predation that can happen on them. So I'm actually going to suggest that this is an example of proximate and ultimate causes. What do I mean by that? Well, Wikipedia defines proximate cause as an event which is closest to or immediately responsible for causing some observed result. And an ultimate cause is a higher level or real reason something occurred. As an example, the Titanic hit an iceberg and sank. The proximate cause is the fact that the Titanic hit the iceberg, put a hole in it, put it to the bottom. The ultimate cause is the fact that the captain of the ship steered into an ice field area at recklessly high speed and then hit an iceberg. So ultimately, the Titanic sank, not because of the iceberg, but because of the captain steering. That's the difference between the ultimate and proximate cause. I'm going to suggest that it's exactly what's going on here. Because the predation is the proximate cause, not the ultimate cause of the frequency change. Predation affects how many of which color are in the population, but it's not the cause. I'm going to suggest instead, because there are no change in species characteristics, you get black and speckled and you can go back and forth, and, but I'm going to suggest the frequency is a directed response to environmental cues. Pollution changes the color, the moths respond by generating by one of two ways. Either they generate more of one color or another, or they just move so they're not picked off. So what about size-selective fisheries? Which many of you not, may not be familiar with, but again, I work for a fish sciences company, so I've got to throw something like this in. Um, this is a key example of selection by choice, perhaps. In other words, predators are opportunistic. They'll grab whatever they can. In fishing, you target the larger, faster-growing fish, intelligently deciding to take the larger, faster fish because they're better eating. So it's been observed that some heavily fished North Atlantic populations now, on average, tend to be smaller and mature at younger ages than they did in the past. And some examples of that are Atlantic cod, the length of maturity decreased 10 centimeters in seven years. Pretty fast change. And another example is Atlantic silver sides. Their weighted age, so in other words, the weight they are at a certain age, at a given age, decreased 40% in four generations. Pretty fast. And in addition to that, the rates of change appear to be correlated with the intensity of fishing. More fishing, this habit seems to happen faster, which begs the question, is fishing responsible for changing the dynamics of the population for selecting for smaller, faster-growing fish? This would be called, of course, fisheries-induced evolution. Well, there's a 2014 study that was done where they looked at the modeling and the empirical studies of harvesting, and one of the first things they concluded was that it's notoriously difficult to pin one of these changes, or this change, on 
natural selection because changing environmental parameters like temperature, food, and habitat directly influence the development of fish. And they also discovered that the observed rates of change are four times faster than predicted by the models using natural selection. They're very rapid. In addition to that, the changes are phenotypic. They're developmental. They're not genetic, which means they're likely repeatable and reversible, just like we've talked about. In addition to that, there's another problem, and that is this is really an example of artificial selection, not natural selection, because it's interfering with adaptation. Smaller fish don't do well in the ocean. They get eaten. So this is not an adaptive change that is happening. But I'm going to suggest that in addition to that, that fishing really is the proximate cause, not the ultimate cause, because the change in species characteristics is directed in response to population cues. In other words, the fishing changes the dynamics of the population of fish, and the fish respond to that by, by adjusting their size and their weight at age. So in other words, fishing may remove the large fish, but the fact that the large fish are gone in the population is what is giving the cue for this response. Another classic example, antibiotic resistance. In this case, it's not a matter of opportunity of predation or selecting it by intelligence. We're actually directly manipulating the environment. We're, producing, we're introducing antibiotics into a spot where there's bacteria and killing off the one, killing off hopefully all of them. But what we've discovered is that they don't all die. And this is classically explained by studies that have discovered um, that you've got some bacteria that have an enzyme which takes in the poison, processes it, or ta takes in the, the substance, processes, and, and creates a poison or a toxin which then kills it. That's how it works. But there are some which have a mutation, which are different, where the enzyme is not there. And so they don't process the substance and make poison out of it, so they survive. And they continue to reproduce, and the others don't. And as a result, pretty soon the entire population doesn't die when you apply the antibiotic. They become resistant to the antibiotic. So there's a couple things to note about this. First of all, there's extreme selection pressure. Um, it's a binary change, either live or die. Um, and that happens very rapidly. I mean, it doesn't take long on a course of antibiotics to kill off the ones that the antibiotics are aimed at, right? A few days. But what's interesting is that similar mutations appear to occur repeatedly across many different types of bacteria and sometimes even be shared be between bacteria. So this change, this mutation is repeatable. And not only that, but they're not very well adapted outside of the environment that they're in. If you put them outside in the wild, so to speak, they're not very fit for them. They quickly die out, so the population very quickly reverses to the other strain, the one that is not antibiotic resistance. So I'm going to suggest that that's another, yet another example <clears throat> of a proximate cause. Antibiotic is the proximate cause, not the ultimate cause. In fact, I'm going to suggest that the change in the enzyme production is directed in response to detecting the antibiotic. And uh, I, in a second, you're going to see some reasons why I'm, I'm going to say that. But in any case, what I'm, what I'm saying here is that these classic examples of natural selection filtering out of a population are, in fact, not examples of natural selection. And here's why I say that. Because remember, natural selection assumes, first of all, random variation. And second of all, differential survival of the environment as a filter. You remember this diagram? The variations happen randomly, and the environment chooses in a manner of speaking, doesn't really do that, but it filters or, or, or filters out or decides between the different variations. That's the idea of natural selection. Um, however, what we are observing here is that, in fact, variation is rapid, repeatable, reversible, precisely controlled. It's not random. It's directed. And, in addition to that, that the environment actually interferes with the survival of these organisms because it acts against adaptation. It introduces genetic drift, which removes information, and genetic loading, which corrupts and destroys information. So in other words, the environment doesn't filter, it degrades. So what I'm suggesting is that both assumptions of natural selection are invalid. The natural selection does not explain adaptation in either the evolution model or the creation model. So this is the way we would look at it from a diagram point of view. 
<clears throat> on the top is a direct variation model we've talked about where it appears that organisms are directing what's happening to, ad to adapt. At the bottom is the creation idea of natural selection happening in both long-term and short-term changes in populations. What I'm saying is that instead what's happening is natural degradation. In other words, genetic loading doesn't influence random variation, it is random variation and it corrupts information. And the genetic drift doesn't influence differential survival, it is differential survival. <clears throat> That's what's happening. And because of that, it leads not to adaptation but limitation. It is destroying and degrading the process of adaptation. <clears throat> and that inevitably it will lead to extinction. Which is exactly what Sanford is saying with genetic loading. The above, the other process I'm going to call imminent selection. <clears throat> because what it does is it manages information, it doesn't degrade it. Excuse me for a second here. Why did I choose the word imminent? Well, because imminent means internal or innate. This is an ability the organism has to direct its own variation from the genome. And I also chose imminent because it's sort of a play on words. It happens fast, imminent. It's imminently happening. <laughs> so I'm going to suggest there are, in fact, two competing models of adaptation and that that bottom one is really not adaptation at all. It's degradation. So the question I have then is, question I have is with my clicker will work. Let's try that again. There we go. Are these the two processes we talked about earlier? Remember we found that there are, there are likely two processes from those mitochondrial clocks? So in other words, does imminent selection, that top process, explain episodic or periodic rate of change in speciation? An organism is responding to its environment and generating genetic diversity to adapt. And does natural degradation explain the linear trend? In other words, it's a process that is occurring naturally. It simply degrades and corrupts over time, and it's inevitable. And it just continues on at a constant rate, a linear trend. <clears throat> Remember, this is a diagram. So I'm talking about imminent selection being the process that everything goes along, an environment changes, and the organism responds. Environment changes, the organism responds. Imminent, or deg natural degradation simply occurs over time as a natural process that just corrupts and destroys. And because of that, the total information continues to increase, to, fra to fractionalize or, or, you know, goes through fractionation. That way, the number of species does never go down in this model, right? It keeps going up. <clears throat> With the apostle exception of Darwin's finches, of course. So, we've got these two competing models of adaptation. Are there really two processes that both explain what's happening? In other words, this bottom one is, and that's a little hard to see, but I've kind of hash marked it out here in red. This bottom process is destructive and linear. This top process is creative and periodic. And I'm going to suggest that the two go together. In other words, this natural degradation through random variation from disruptive microchemistry, things going on at the biochemical level, leading to genetic loading, impacts and corrupts over time the genome. And differential survival due to an adverse environment randomly destroys information, it removes it, and that affects how a, a species or a, or a creature is distributed across the landscape. Things like predation, catastrophe, isolation, etc. And so what happens here is in directed variation and differential distribution, this impacts it so that over time, instead of continuing to go around there, it starts to become limited because the information gets degraded and eventually it reaches extinction. And I'm going to suggest that what happens then is, as this process occurs, speciation occurs. You move from a kind, which is the, sort of at the family level, all the way down to species level. You continually degrade information until it's all broken up and you've got species. And that happens over time because natural degradation is impacting the imminent selection process. So that begs the question, well, how does imminent selection work? I mean, that science sounds fine in concept. It's sort of taken from observing how creatures adapt to the environment. But is there any kind of a basis that would, that would make me think that this actually occurs? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. But the caveat is that it's not fully understood. It's very complex. But there are some clues. The first one is that DNA is more complex than originally assumed. Why did I say that? Well, most DNA, about 95%, is non-coding. 
In other words, it doesn't code for proteins. It doesn't contain instruction for proteins. And for a long time, it's been considered junk. In fact, that's been actually one of the reasons why neo-Darwinian evolution has continued to be seen as valid is because you've got this huge genome and 95% of it, they can just randomly make mutations and changes and eventually one will pop up that actually codes for something. But there's 5%, of course, that does code in proteins and that's, you know, the, chan the result of, of chance over time is the idea. And it's interspersed with the other, so it's not like all the coding is in one section and the non-coding is the other. It's just, it's non-coding, non-coding, coding, non-coding, non-coding, coding, like that. It's interspersed. But it's now becoming clear that all of DNA is functional. It's transcribed, or, or almost all of it. It's transcribed in more than one direction by RNA. Um, it has regulatory functions. The, the more it's studied, the more it's seen that the entire genome is functional. It's not junk. In fact, one would argue that the reason why it was thought of as junk is because it's so complex in its information that we simply didn't understand what we were looking at. And it serves multiple regulatory functions. Because of that, and these new discoveries, the current models of DNA are inadequate. There's a couple of them. One of them is a random sequence model, um, which I just explained to you, a bunch of random sequences. And the problem with that model is it can't explain simultaneously variation and stasis. So in other words, if it's just random and you, make, you can make a change anywhere, right, why do creatures stay the same over a long period of time? They should just go work, you know, they should just diverge very quickly. And the second model is a sentence model, and that's a little bit better. It says that, you know, you've got sequences that are arranged sort of in a sentence that's read. But the problem with that is you can't do variation and readability at the same time. If you have a sentence and you introduce a whole bunch of random letters to it, the sentence no longer means anything. So that's not adequate either. There's another model that's been recently proposed that's looking a lot more promising, and that is a computer program model. What do I mean by that? Well, computer program, for those of you who are code writers around here, know that both the data and the instructions are included in or combined in a single stream of code, okay? So the reason why it's thought that maybe that model might explain DNA is that's exactly what DNA looks like, right? You've got non-coding DNA and coding DNA, instructions and data, combined in a single stream. You've got a whole bunch of instructions and then find some data, then a whole bunch more instructions and find some more data. It looks like computer code, which is interesting. Not only that, but here's what's even more interesting. Computer code programs can dynamically load, move, and control portions of the instruction code. And they can even generate sections of code on the fly. Turn them on, turn them off, call them in different orders, etc. It's very dynamic. And they use algorithms and functions combined with variables to solve problems. And a lot of times these variables are determined by user input or sensory input from outside that determines how the program then responds. And another important thing to note is the functionality of computer program is a result of top-level instructions which are fixed and invariant. They don't change. The program itself doesn't change, but it can do a lot internally to the program, right? Now, of course, that's very interesting because DNA appears to have a physical structure very similar to a computer program, and it controls the expression of adaptive traits in organisms by rapidly responding to change. It seems to be solving problems. So it's unreasonable su to suggest that DNA is a biochemical program which solves environmental challenges. In other words, adaptation is not occurring because of natural selection, random variation, and a filter, but instead because the organism is pre-programmed to respond to the environment and solve environmental challenges based on its own DNA code, which runs like a computer program, which does what is necessary dynamically, moving code and structure around, calling different word, et cetera, in order to generate the proper traits to solve that environmental problem. So there's some evidence, of course, from adaptation examples of what I just talked about. In the case of Omicus, there's, we see sections of genetic code being turned on and off. For instance, osmoregulation. One fish has the ability to deal with salt water, one does not. That involves a certain genetic section of code that's turned on in one and not in the other. But they're the same species, same genetic code, just some turn on and turn off. In the case of the three-spine stickleback, we see regulatory sequences involved playing the prominent role, and it's dynamically reassembling blocks of code within its gene. We also see in the case of the fig nematode, the arctic hare, and the neomoria arizonian moth that phenotypic differences are responding to environmental variables. 
case of input output. In addition to that, we see in the case of hammerhead sharks and the Darwin's finches that functions and algorithms are in control of what's happening. It's mathematically precise. It's precisely controlled. Exactly what one would expect from a computer program. It looks very similar to a, to a very sophisticated program to solve environmental challenges. So I'm going to suggest that actually the old way of looking at DNA as a library is incorrect. In the library analogy to DNA, basically it's a fixed number of books. You want to read a certain subject, you grab that book off, you read it, you put it back, grab another book off, read it and put it back. I would say instead DNA is not like that at all. DNA, in fact, is more like an electronic reader, like a Kindle. The book that's read is a combination of the hardware and software. It is generated on demand and it often involves user input. You ask it which book you want to read. But the book doesn't exist out there until it's called for as generated on demand. Now, it's an imperfect analogy because DNA doesn't cease to exist when it's not called, but nonetheless, the point is, it's a computer program which generates what's necessary as opposed to just choosing it off the shelf. So, is there evidence, not only that it's a computer program, but that, in fact, just like in a Kindle, you ask for a certain book, it, pre it presents a book. Is there evidence that DNA variables are changing in response to the environmental parameters? And the answer to that is yes. And there's a whole field to discuss this, uh, to, to uh, research this called epigenetics. And that is an entire talk by itself. So I'm not going to go into that today. But I'm going to sort of summarize it by giving you uh, so a couple points and an example. So for instance, what epigenetics deals with is that the fact that traits are turned on and off in the offspring based on the environments to which the parents are exposed. So as an example, guinea pigs in the wild. It gets really hot when they produce. They produce offspring that are already adapted with certain enzymes and certain other internal functions for a hotter climate. And the way that happens usually is there's physical markers like methylation and other things that are attached to sections of DNA so that when RNA transcribes those sections, it knows not to turn that trait on or yes to turn that trait on. So what's happening is the gene hasn't changed at all, but they, based on the experience of the parents, they've gotten environmental input and they have marked that fact on the DNA code so that their offspring are already adapted to it. Fascinating. In addition to that, there's additional examples from juvenile embryonic development. So it happens also at the developmental level before in the embryo as well as in the young creature. And of course, an example of that would be, of course, omicus, where the juvenile develops to either be anadromous or resident based on environmental cues. It's detecting some in the environment and responding by becoming one or the other. And of course, the finch beats examples, and this one, of course, I would argue, is that uh, it's controlled, we, we already saw that it's controlled very precisely, but the question is, why does it go one way or the other? And the answer, I believe, is that there's something in the environment that is triggering the development program to go one way or another. And in fact, all of this has a biochemical basis going on, but it's very cutting edge right now, so it's not really very fully understood, but it appears that's what's happening. So, uh, is there an example of this happening actually, you know, we can see a creature responding this way and solving an environmental problem. Well, I talked about the nylon digesting bacteria earlier, right? So, which is amazing in itself that bacteria can, can digest something that's not natural. But in 1975, Japanese science discovered that and they found two species that can do this. Um, and of course, because it's not naturally occurring, the nylon, um, there's enzyme involved that don't catalyze other compounds, suggesting they're brand new. They never existed before. Um, and both random mutation and gene duplication were ruled out as a source of raw material to make these new genes. In other words, these new genes weren't modified from prior existing genes. These are brand new genes created on the fly, so to speak. And what's even more interesting is how quickly they're created on the fly. The experiments have shown that with at least one of the species, you could take a strain that doesn't have the enzymes and in nine days it's got them. Didn't have them didn't modify existing ones, it creates brand new enzymes in nine days when exposed to an environment where it can get digest nylon. That is amazing. <laughs> and in addition to that, these genes are located on something called plasmids, which are extra chromosomal loops of DNA and that can be swapped between species. And this is exactly where antibiotic resistance is as well in plasmids in many cases, suggesting that the antibiotic resistance is also generated on the fly. But in addition to that, of course, these bacteria haven't changed. 
in 120 years, the basic program is still the same. And that's equivalent, because of the fast bacteria reproduction rate, equivalent to mil tens of millions of years in human generations, they still have the same program. Remember invariant fixed upper level program, changing things on the fly? It sure looks like that's what's going on. So the question then becomes, OK, that's great for bacteria, but what about higher organisms? How would they adapt in this manner? Well, I'm going to, this is a hypothesis, OK? I'm, this is somewhat speculation, but this is guided by, <laughs> by evidence and experience. I'm going to suggest that something similar to this is what's going on. Um, you're familiar before with the family of the kind, the genus and the species. And we've talked about phenotype, fig nematodes, for instance, and morphotype, omicus, for instance. Normally, a genetic code or an end development is separated into the phenotype, which is an expression of the code. Epigenetics, it's developmental. It's the genetic code hasn't changed. It's just expressed differently. And then the rest is just the genotype, which is genetics. I'm going to suggest there's actually another level in there. And I'm going to call it the omatotype, which comes from the Greek for the word group. OK? And why is this important? Well, the bottom level deals with characteristics this deals with forms, and this deals with groups. Let me give you some examples of what I mean by this, OK? Fig nematodes, with that, that species, you'll notice the species and genus overlap. Species is really, defining a species and genus is more of an art than a science, to be honest. And there's lots of overlap here. Um, I'm, so I'm going to actually suggest that this is actually a better idea, or a better model for, for uh, dealing with it. But in any case, so the fig nematode example, there were three morpho and 15 phenotypes. So for instance, those three morphotypes were seen as three different species, and each one having five phenotypes within it. I'm going to suggest that it's actually all one thing. It just has three morphos and 15 phenos. In other words, the idea of species is meaningless here. Omicus, two morpho and multiple pheno. So morpho being anatomist and resident, and there's all kinds of different variation beyond that. Three spine stickleback. There was two morpho as well and multiple pheno as well. But instead of just being at the, that this level where the, the primary change took place, it, it overlapped both levels, influenced by epigenetics and genetics. Epigenetics meaning expression of the code, genetics being different code. And I'm going to suggest that exactly the same thing happened in the past with the, the genus level. So for instance, with cats, remember you had all those different Genus, or all the different genus? I'm going to suggest the genus is the uh, monotype. There's six of them. They have 16 morphotypes within that and multiple phenotypes below. So what I'm suggesting here is you've got a nested level, nested levels of almost like modular toolbox that can be used in adaptation. And that's what's really going on. So you'll notice, though, that there's arrows going both directions. I'm saying that the, the, the critter, the kind, can proceed over multiple generations from a monotype all the way down to phenotype, so sort of from genus down to species. But you notice there's, there's arrows going back up. Why is that? Well, because theoretically that could happen, right? You've got a computer code as an analogy that can make changes in the fly and dynamically, et cetera. So why couldn't it go backwards? But in, rea in, in uh, nature, we rarely, if ever, observe that. Again, maybe Darwin's finches is a, a, a uh, exception to that. And so why, I mean, if this model is right, and it's really a computer code, why can't we go backwards? I mean, it's just, it's the same code. Why can't it go both directions, right? Well, that's asking the question, how does natural degradation work, right? We talked about this. So <clears throat> I'm going to suggest something that, I'm not the first to suggest this, but I'm going to suggest that this really starts to tie things together. And that is having to do with mutation. So mutation is a permanent heritable change in the nucleotide sequence in a gene or chromosome. So it's just a change. There's nothing implied here about whether it's intentional or accidental. It's a change. That's how a mutation is defined. What I'm going to suggest is there's a very interesting possibility here based on the model we just talked about. And that is that most mutations are a direct result of dynamic changes to the code made by this higher level DNA program instructions, and that they're repeatable, reversible, and precisely controlled. And in fact, there's, there's quite a few people that are starting to recognize that a lot of mutations are controlled very closely by the genetic code. And in fact, I, if you recall, when I, at the very beginning of the presentation, I talked about how the fact of mutations, most mutations are not random. That's exactly what we're talking about here. 
Okay? I'm, I'm going to suggest, though, that there are random mutations, and that in, in Sanford found them, for instance, in genetic loading, and that what they do is they disrupt this process. So most mutations are intentional, directed, but random ones lead to the failure of that process over time. They increasingly corrupt it and make it fail. And that random survival, which is genetic drift, exasperates the problem because it removes information at the epigenetic level, which is the interaction between the creature and the environment that, that affects those variables that the program then uses to adapt. So what I'm saying is that natural degradation causes irreversible loss of adapt adaptability over time. So in other words, in this diagram, genetic drift acting at the level of epigenetics and genetic loading acting at the level of genetics breaks these links in both directions. And I'm going to further suggest that it's much harder to go back up than it is down because of the complexity of it. And as you know, with most machines, the more complex something is, the easier it is to break when you start making small changes. And I'm saying that's exactly what's going on here. So what I'm saying is that the genus, species, genus and species level, or the homotype, morphotype, and phenotype level, were all in the original kind, and that the same genetic biological program generated all that diversity and theoretically it could go backwards, but over time it has been broken, so it cannot. And furthermore, it can't even go forwards in many cases. So this is the model, right? You've got your directed variation, a differential distribution adaptation, and you've got this natural degradation, this is imminent selection, is impacting this process and breaking it and limiting it over time, and eventually it's going to lead to extinction because the program's going to entirely break down which is exactly what Sanford found. So what are the implications of this? And I'm going to wrap up with this. Well, first of all, life is more amazing than previously acknowledged. I mean, think about this. There is an incredibly complex biological program which is allowing organisms to overcome environmental challenges on the fly. And due to this dynamic nature, it does it with speed and efficiency. Incredible design going on here. In addition to that, DNA is widely recognized as the most complex information storage system. I'm going to suggest it's also the most complex program ever devised. And keep in mind that DNA is only the information that's utilized by hundreds of molecular machines in the cell which are necessary for life. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is it's simply impossible to imagine this level of complexity apart from purposeful design and vast intelligence. It's impossible. Um, I mean, it's hard enough to try to come up with how you get proteins from chance, but to come up with coding DNA, non-coding DNA, and higher level instructions in an incredibly complex program that on the fly adapts to change is impossible without purposeful design. Just, you just can't do it. The problem becomes incredibly insurmountable to try to explain that apart from intelligent design. But even more importantly, I'm going to say this. Death is not the mechanism that sustains life. Now, that sounds like a really interesting statement, but that's exactly what natural selection says. Whether in the evolution model or the creation model, keep that in mind, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging the crea current creation model as well. Death is not the mechanism that sustains life. Why do I say that? Well, look at the model again. This portion down here, natural degradation, is not the portion that causes adaptation, right? It breaks adaptation, which means this portion, which relies on decay, disruptive microchemistry, and death, adverse environment, did not exist before the fall. Only this process existed before the fall. There is no death implied here, just adaptation. So that the consequences of the fall and the sin are extremely destructive. They are destroying, over time, the most complex adaptive computer biological program ever devised. And ultimately, because of their action that's inevitable, that linear trend over time, left unchecked over time, it would lead to limitation and finally extinction of all life. Pretty sobering consequences for sin. That's all I've got, except for questions. If you've got some questions, I think we have a little time, don't we? A few minutes? Okay. Thank you. Um, actually, our time is 
up for uh, pretty soon for our our group to be able to use this facility. Okay. So, um, Keith, what do you think? Can we press a few questions time-wise? Okay, let's take a few questions. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of questions after that. I, I've done right. my best to rock the creationist and the evolutionist boat today, so I'm sure some people are going, huh? So yeah, hit me with your questions. Uh, yes, uh, very uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Very interesting and uh, tell you've been thinking a little bit about this. Um, so back to the, uh, the big picture here, could you go through that one more time since I think it's most important that we understand this from a theological standpoint. Um, at the time of creation, what did we, what, how was life formulated, designed, and then what happened was it at the fall or was it with the institution of the curse that things went bad or have you got any way of knowing? All right. All right. So that's a, yeah, that's a good question. So, so uh, I mean, ultimately the design of life is still the same. It hasn't changed, right? It's, it's uh, whoops, I can go backwards there. Uh, so the design hasn't changed. What I'm, what I'm arguing is that the, the same process that was available for adaptation before the fall when God said, you know, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth perhaps implying there are going to be different, unless the earth is exactly the same everywhere, there are going to be different ecological niches. And therefore, one would think that, that, I mean, one would think based on the fact that life is designed to begin with, and we see this adaptation ability, that those creatures would have had the ability to adapt to different ecological niches. However, before the fall, and the curse is part of the fall, um, so there's sin and there's, there's decay of creation as a result. You know, later in the New Testament, it talks exactly about that. Um, before that happens, there was no death involved. Creatures adapted, and they didn't die. They filled the earth, right? At the fall, death entered the picture, and that's right here. Differential survival, not, oops. There we go. Differential survival, it's not even, I think my battery may be running out a little bit. There, there we go. Differential survival, that's death. Not everything survives as long at all. I mean, ultimately, all dies, but they die at different rates at different times, right? So it's differential. It's sort of random. And then, and then this disruptive micro microchemistry, you know, that's a, physical, that's a physical biochemical process that simply, it's, you know, thermodynamics. It simply breaks down over time. And is thermodynamics the curse? Probably not, but it certainly is an aspect of the curse. Um, so that, that as a result of the fall, this whole process down here started, and it didn't exist before. So, so when, you know, when Scripture talks about how death is an enemy, that's exactly what's going on here. This, this process is the enemy of adaptation, is what I'm saying. Good question. So there's Scout. Oh. Thank you very much. I, I've been waiting for this kind of a presentation for a long time. Uh, because in my view, one of the major uh, shortcomings of the creation community has been, to fail, been the failure to follow through on the theological implications of God's command to go fill the earth. It means to fill all the various niches and just think about when, uh, when uh, God gives commands and then he always provides and so we should have known this and uh, the first thing I saw really I think 2008 when Kevin Anderson talked about the uh, the nylon uh, maybe that answers the, uh, the the question of why the oil spill cleanup happened so quickly in in, in, in the Gulf of Mexico that's possible a, a question for you on this you, you mentioned Susan Mazur's book and yes. uh, I'm curious about what kind of reaction you might be getting from people like uh, retired Eugenie Scott and her successor at the National Center for Scientism Education because in that book I think she she stopped and she saw Eugenie Scott at a meeting of muckety mucks in New York and said uh, well Ms. Ms. Scott are you are you dealing with this question of some possible uh, things internal to life to make these adjustments and she said no we don't want to touch that because the creationists might run with it so right. uh, what, what, what kind of uh, so what, what kind of results are you, are you getting what kind of feedback yeah are you getting so, so, I, so I'm gonna answer your question uh, uh, quickly and broadly so um, as I just mentioned a second ago I'm challenging both the evolutionist community and the creationist community because the current creation model of speciation after the flood relies on natural selection I am suggesting the natural selection does not exist in other words, it does not cause adaptation. 
there is no such thing as random variation plus filter equals adaptation. That's what I'm saying. And so it's been very interesting to see the reaction because the evolutionist community has recognized this certainly for the long-term changes in populations, as I was saying, from the Altenburg Conference, and it's become quite controversial, and that's why the whole structural versus, versus external debate has come up. And that's why they're very cautious about it, because if you start saying that, that organisms themselves are directing adaptation, that speaks of design big time. And that's why, they're, that's why they're very tiptoeing around it. But what I found more interesting is the reaction of the creation community. Um, I've done some work with Dr. Galuza from ICR and Brian Thomas from ICR. We've published um, a couple of articles, uh, and they were very controversial. They went over like a lead balloon. Um, and in fact, now we have been banned from, from publishing by the editors of the three major creation journals on this subject. They treat it as axiomatic. And I, I mean, the only way I can explain that is fear of losing respectability in the scientific community. The, the kind of way it's been said is, hey, um, it makes it appear like creationists have no explanation for this process. If we say natural selection isn't happening, that we have no explanation for scientifically observed fact. Well, first of all, I'm not so sure I'd be concerned about losing respectability. Um, <laughs> when you have a creationist label in front of you to begin with, that you've already lost it. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's true. Um, and second of all, we should be after truth, not fear. I mean, we, should, we, should, we shouldn't worry about what other people are thinking. We should be trying to figure out what's really going on. And this makes a lot more sense of not only the evidence, but the theology, as has been pointed out. So I'm, I'm a little disappointed with the reaction to the creation community. Hopefully, by doing talks like this and getting the video out there and doing more work on it, perhaps uh, they'll warm to the idea. Anyway, do we have time for one more? Is that it? Uh, I think we probably better shut our right. discussion down. If you have a further questions, come on up if you've got a few minutes. Yeah, I'll be available so. for a few minutes, but then I, I hear we're going to lunch, and actually I'm going to do it.